very nature of who Jesus is, is identical to the very nature of what we see in God, which is what we say in the Creed. We were talking a little bit about this in the forum. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Then that begins to shape, I hope, how we relate to God. Because what John is giving us in this lesson, in this epistle lesson, in the simplest of language, if you ever take Greek, New Testament Greek, where they start you is in 1 John. Because the vocabulary is about C. Dick Jane Rudd. It's very, very simple language. And what you find in, the, in this epistle is someone who has walked with God for a very, very long time and who has the extraordinary capacity to distill this very complicated set of truths down to its essence. And it is out of that kind of profundity and kindness that he speaks to his, his readers in the kind of gentle tone that he uses. I mean, if, if you know maybe a hundred words in Koine Greek, you can translate first John. That, you, you'd have a hard time if that's all you had if you, for example, were going to translate an article out of the New Yorker or something like that. We're used to a much more complex vocabulary, most of us. And therefore, it almost takes an effort to step back and exhale and to think about a different kind of pace when we read the first John epistle because the words are meant to be pondered and to be savored, to stop and, oh, let me think about that. So, I want to pull a couple of things out to say, what does that have to say about who God is? And then what are the implications for us in terms of both how we relate to God and the character of out of which we live, how we live? You see, we're stepping in the middle of a letter here. We're at chapter 4. We've already had a bunch of things in the preceding chapters. And way, in the way the gospel, the, I'm sorry, the epistle of John begins is, it's very kind of visceral. He says, that which we have seen with our eyes, which we have heard with our ears, which we, in the Greek it literally means, that which we have handled with our hands. In other words, we're not dealing with a ghost here. We're not dealing with a myth. We're not dealing with an apparition. We're talking about something that really happened within the context of human history, and we got to be a part of it. John says, this is what it is that we're sharing with you. And he begins to talk about who God is in the light of what the writer has learned specifically about who Jesus is. And so he says, even here, he says, God has sent his only son, in other words, unique, there's nobody else like him, into the world for one purpose and for one purpose only, that we might live through him. And think about what that means. Number one, it says to not have what is given to us in the Son means that we are still paupers when it comes to the possibility of life. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. I mean, like, highlight, fireworks, exclamation point, and have it abundant. That's actually what we see in Jesus. This incredible joy, this profound compassion, this huge range of emotions, the ability to be present in the midst of any and all situations. Someone fully alive and alert and available for God to use him at any single moment. That is what life is. And John writes, God sent his only son in the world so that we might live, how? Through him. In other words, that the life of Jesus somehow might come in and through us in a way that completely changes us. Life is anything. If you're a Christian, at least if you're living in any way that is empowered by the very life of Christ, it's anything but boring. It's exciting. It's actually a kind of adventure because you never exact know precisely what's going to happen next. And it has everything to do with your availability toward other people, and toward God. So that no matter what situation in which you find yourself, whether, again, you're at a restaurant, or whether you're any place at all, you're in God's earth. I mean, it's not somehow that there's church over here, and this is sort of this religious place that is sequestered from the rest of 
life. So I can be, if that's true, you see, what that means is I can be like this in church. Hey, how are you? It looks so look very, very different over there. There's actually something wrong with both of those. It is, you see, it's possible to take on a kind of religious character that expresses a kind of escapist piety. I take on a kind of personality that, that has a, a religious facade to it. To use the vernacular, people like that creep me out. <laughs> because I know that they're hiding something. They, they've taken on the form of religion. They can be great lay readers and acolytes, present company excluded. <laughs> and I've met some people who want to go into the priesthood like that. They have all the right answers. They have the piety down pat. But what it's done is it, they found it a way through all of that to protect something that really is ferocious underneath. And it doesn't come out until they get into one of these sessions over here, bam! All of a sudden, this, is, this explosive behavior happens. And, you, and if all you know is the person over here, you go, where, where did that come from? And because you see, Jesus, if, if you'll notice what I said about him earlier, another way to say it is that he lived a fully integrated life. He was always present. All of him was always present. He, he didn't play the facade game where, oh, because I want to be impressive to you, I will act a certain way with you, and because you're very different from them, but I also want to be impressive to you, I act this way. You know what that does? That makes me an actor. One of the things that people loved about Jesus is that he could look in them, and, but not in a way that was condemning. He spoke from in here to the in here that was in them. The psalmist puts it this way, deep calls to deep. Have you ever been around anybody like that? You sit with them and you listen to them and you think, you know, I can tell them anything. That's how Jesus was. And, beloved, if that is how Jesus presented himself, because that's who he is, if what we believe about God is God from God, like from light, that means that's who God is. That I can be all of who I am in his presence. I don't have to hide anything. I mean, he knows me anyway. So I can play this little game as if somehow, you know, I've seen that done where somebody commits something wrong and they sort of act like maybe God doesn't know. And then they show up in church. No, no, no. He's everywhere. It's God's world. So I can be all of who I am in his presence and know that as I pour out all that is in my heart in his presence, he listens. He actually takes me seriously. I matter to him. And all of who I am matters. Because his desire is that, as it says in 1 John, is that I might, what, live, live through him. And that without him, I live in a really deficient position. All of who I am, all that I was made to be in God, has in fact yet to be realized. I walk around in certain ways, even if I'm really smart, and athletic, and talented, and accomplished, I'm still in many ways spiritually crippled if I have not yet been the knee to the Lord Jesus and discovered what true life, true life really is. And it is that true life that defines what John means when he says, beloved, let us love one another. You see, if you're still over here, we all think of love as being nice. Courteous, generous on occasion, especially if it makes you look better. But that's not the kind, that's not love, because that doesn't look like Jesus. You see, if it's if it's the love that John is talking about, it's the love that looks like Jesus. It's not sentimental. It's actually quite courageous. 
It's strong, not weak, because you are willing to literally step into the gap for another person. And you're willing to listen to them with the deepest part of who you are, because you know that God knows you, and he listens to you in the very, very same way. You take them seriously, because he takes you seriously. Which is why later in the same epistle, right here that was read, he said, we love him. Why? Because he first... He first loved us. He took the initiative. God sent his only son into the world. And, and the, the phrase almost feels like a rescue operation. Like he literally helicoptered in. And we're on, like, we're on the island. And the floods are rising. And God literally comes in and rescues us from certain death. That's the, that's the kind of tenor that Jesus is coming into the world has in this epistle. And it's why? It's because of his profound and great love. That he embodies that kind of courageous, vigorous, compassionate, empathetic, I want to be with you no matter what kind of love. And it is in that kind of love to which we are called. In other words, when the rest lesson is read, beloved, let us love one another, that doesn't, that means nothing less than living into the kind of sacrificial, that's another word, sacrificial love that we see in Jesus. And I want you to know that without Christ, it's quite impossible. I can't get there through resolution or trying hard. In fact, because God wants to create in me that kind of supernatural love, what he will do is actually on occasion fight against my efforts to try to be nicer than I used to be. <laughs> because it's genuinely not a human accomplishment. Those who are understanding this kind of love have had those kind of moments where I literally come to the end of myself. Where I don't have it in me to love in that kind of way. It's, I try as I might, it just drives me nuts. On more than one occasion, I've said, Lord, I don't like that person at all. <laughs> but you love them enough to die for them. Obviously, you see things about them that I don't. Show me why you love this person so passionately. That, more often than not, is the story of my life, if I really want to be honest with you. It's not in me to love in the way God wants me. It's not. Except that God is working something new in us. And to use John's language, he says he has given us his spirit. Because again, Trinitarian Christians that we are, what we see in Jesus is what's in the Father, which is also what is in the Holy Spirit. They are undivided in their nature. So if the spirit is in me, it's not some kind of weird spiritualistic thing. No, no, it's actually the very spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, Paul says in Romans. It is that kind of courageous, compassionate, sacrificial love. That's what God puts in us, which is why Paul could be is almost as rude. A kind person, a, a, a courteous person who only thinks about love as courteous would never say, those who say I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. Ooh. But the reason he says that as strongly as he does is because his understanding of both the nature of what and who the spirit is and the impact that spirit has upon human flesh and our intellects and our minds and bodies and spirits. It is the same spirit of Jesus. In other words, if the spirit of Jesus is in me, he's working on it. He's changing it. I'm always on the path of becoming. And that continues literally our entire lives and on into eternity when finally we are completely and totally changed into his likeness. So that no matter how old I get, no matter how long I've been a Christian, to be honest with you, I feel like I'm still just getting started. And I was baptized a long time ago. So beloved, we're going into confirmation. 
one is being presented to us. But it's not merely something that we're observing. It is also the opportunity for us to say, we will, to the promises that we have made to God. And if you have any realism about that at all, as you say, we will, it seems to me I would encourage you to say in your heart, oh God, help me. Work it in me. So that what begins to happen as a result is a kind of compassion that's not, again, syrupy. It's actually quite courageous and tough. It begins to mark our relationships. And it is because God is changing us and we are learning new love for him. And out of that, a new way of loving each other. We love him because he first loved us. And we can say with a certain amount of, I think, real joy. You know, I don't get it right all the time. But God has changed me. So I hope. I have hope for myself. And I have hope for us because we're in this together. To try by God's mercy to say yes to him that we might become, we're not there yet, that we might become the men and women that God has called us to be. That we might be people who are alive. Have that kind of vibrant, joy-filled life that really is the mark of those who belong to Jesus. May that be so for us. Amen. Now, we're actually going to go into confirmation. I want to say a couple things before I do, just to explain. Some of you heard this when I was here at one point before. I sit to preside at confirmation because that's a nod to the ancient nature of the office. It used to be, centuries and centuries ago, that when someone operated in authority, that person would sit, not stand. And even the, the way that I would pray Hands, it's ancient, but it's a prayer for God's protection, God's covering. Second, a little oil on the thumb, sign of the cross. Oil is always a symbol in the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, for the presence of the Holy Spirit. The oil of gladness, it says in the Psalms. So we're saying, oh, mark this person anew in the power of your Holy Spirit. And then lastly, a slight slap on the cheek. People don't expect that. <laughs> You've been warned. It's an ancient part of the right, but it's ancient for a purpose because it's a commitment to serve Christ even in difficulty. See, Jesus says it's a promise, not an option. In the world, you will have tribulation. Sometimes life gets really hard. And anybody with any maturity at all says, well, of course it does. <clears throat> so we're not, in, we're not freed from hardness of life. But we are saying, even in the midst of difficulty, by God's grace, I want to be faithful to you. And so that's what this is. And especially in this day, when many sisters and brothers in our Anglican communion are suffering genuine persecution because they belong to Jesus Christ. We, in this global communion, are saying, even in confirmation, I'm willing to take my place with them because they are my sisters and brothers. And I care. And if anything like that were to come my way, I will do my best to be faithful. As I say over and over, confirmation is not for whiners. <laughs> and neither is the Christian.